We are really pleased to invite you here and for you to come tonight, ladies and gentlemen, John McDonald. <laughs> I'm going to have to be careful because the BBC are filming this. <laughs> My mum used to watch the TV as I was on. And she died last year. She'd always phone up and say, look, you look tired, you need a haircut. And will you, for God's sake, stop swearing on TV? So we have to be careful of our language and what we say. Um, thanks for the invitation. I'm really grateful. I'm sorry. I'm sorry I didn't get back to you until quite late. As, as you said, it was, it was a relatively relaxing summer. Uh, um, Jeremy was elected two weeks ago on the biggest mandate that any Labour leader has ever had. And I'll go through the campaign and how we got there uh, shortly. Uh, but the p political background to it, to be frank, is that there was a determination amongst our members and supporters and people in the community that we needed, we needed to position the Labour Party now straightforwardly as an anti-austerity party. And that was, I think, that motivated people throughout that campaign. And it's because, I suppose it's because the life experiences that we've gone through, not just over the last five or six years, but actually over the last 20, 25 years. <coughs> On the S.O. Davis Memorial discussions that you've had in the past, tribute has been paid to S.O. Davis on the basis of his role that he played. And I don't think we, to be frank, I don't think we commemorate enough those that were part of that generation that eventually formed the Atlee government and gave us the welfare state. All of us, my life, my generation's life in particular, was transformed by that Atlee government. I was born in 51. I was born in 51. I'm sorry if I'll personalise this, but I think we need to share our experiences to remind each other what that government gave us, to be honest, and what a Labour government can do in power. Because I think some people have forgotten I was born in 51. My dad was a Liverpool docker. My mum was a cleaner. We lived just off the Scotland Road in Liverpool in a tenement. Now, I, I later found out in the very sociological studies it was one of the worst slums in Europe. We just called it home, actually. I remember the day. I remember the day we moved out. We had to move south for work and we got a council prefab. I remember the day we celebrated when we got a brick council house garden front and back, bedroom for my brother and myself, we've been sleeping together all those years, and a living room, kitchen and all the rest. Now that was the experience of working class people moving out of slums in Liverpool, Glasgow and everywhere else into a council house, and we celebrated. We absolutely celebrated that day. My generation, education, we went to state schools, and then we went on, to, I went on the shop floor, and then I studied again and went to university. I went to university on a grant, on a grant. And that grant actually enabled me to have a university degree. I worked during the summer, not during term time. I worked during the summer. But it enabled me to have a grant, a decent standard of living as a student. The occasional pint, I admit it. But it was a free education. That generation of mine, I, when I was born in 51 in Liverpool, my mum was one of that first early generations to give birth under the NHS. She convalesced in an NHS convalescent home after I was born. That was unheard of and unthinkable in the generation before. Only 10 years before, that would have been unthinkable. All of those benefits came from a Labour government. But also, they gave us rights. They gave us rights. They gave us trade union rights. They gave us legal rights, legal aid. To go to an industrial tribunal or into court. You exercise rights as an individual. That whole panoply of the welfare state was constructed by a Labour government, the Atlee government. After the experiences of the 20s and 30s where people were living in poverty, there was a depression, but they managed, even when this country was in the deepest debt we'd ever been in after the Second World War, they found, they found the resources to house people, to give kids an education free of charge, they get to treat people through the NHS, to provide them with basic trade union rights and regal rights, all put together as the welfare state. Now, even then, the Tories were opposed to it. They fought that Atlee government to a nail. 
They mobilised whole communities. They mobilised sections of the rich, the media thrown at them. Nye Bevan, you would have thought he was the living embodiment of evil if you'd have read some of the Tory press at that point in time. They threw everything at that government and it stood firm and implemented And eventually the Tories had to accept that welfare state. And they accepted it for 20 years. And then the Thatcher government came along. And the Thatcher government was the start of the dismantling of systematic dismantling of the welfare state. And they started in the 80s and then when the Tories came back in 2010 in the coalition and now on their own, what we've seen is that systematic dismantling of the welfare state. Council housing brought to an end virtually. And rent, council house rents forced up. Council houses sold off. In my constituency at the moment, this is the irony, most of the council housing is now sold off, but we've got a housing crisis. So what happens? My council is now renting back council houses that they sold 20 years ago from landlords at a high cost. It is insane. Yeah. And yet tonight in my constituency in West London, 200 families will be living in bed and breakfast. We've reinvented in my area back to backs. We have houses that are rented at the front for 1,200 quid a month, at the back rented for 1,200 quid a month. I've got families living in sheds. Shanty towns are being erected in my constituency in London. Garages and sheds are being converted into properties. In the general election, I went around photographing them so that people knew what was going on, because no one would believe us. So housing, which was a fundamental right under a Labour government, council houses being built on a massive scale, including not just by Attlee, but the Wilson and Callaghan governments as well, brought to a halt, sold off. And then, of course, what happens then is house prices raised because there's a shortage of housing. And we now live in a situation where homelessness, tonight, those kids going to bed and breakfast, accommodation, will not know tomorrow or the next day where they'll be going to school. They will not know whether they'll see their friends again. Because what happens is they get churned. They're in temporary accommodation at best for 12 months license or bed and breakfast for a few days, then they're moved out of the community. They will never know the security that I had as a generation, thanks to that generation of S.O. Davis and the Atlee government that built those homes. In terms of education, education for me was free. I always thought that education was a gift from one generation to another, not something to be bought and sold. And that's why I voted against tuition fees under a new Labour government. What happens now? The Tories and Liberals get in, despite all their promises, they max out on the tuition fees. We now have kids coming out of university, you know as well as I do, at 20, 30,000 pounds debt. Those ones who want to stay on and do master's degrees and PhDs, to be frank, are costed out of it. So becoming a college lecturer in the future will be just dedicated to the middle classes and others. Because working class kids just can't stay on to do it. I think that's a scandal. In Wales, you know better than any other part of this country about the value of education. And yet they've transformed it into a commodity to be bought and sold. In terms of health, you know what's happening. Privatisation. In England, you're, to be frank, in Wales you've been relatively protected because of the Labour administration here. But in England, privatisation is going on a pace. And you've seen what's happening, the, the individual staff themselves, it's not just privatisation, it's the intensity of the work that is undertaken by GPs, nurses and others. So we now have a situation where the NHS is under intense pressure and the Tories then criticise the NHS and they provide the, well, they provide the private alternative, is that something that is desirable for people? You, so you can see, I think within the next few years, if they get their way, they'll kill off the NHS one altogether. Despite all their commitments will be free at the point of need, it will be provided by the private sector, and then you'll see the costs escalate and prices introduced. And in terms of legal rights, well, you know as well as I do. They've withdrawn legal aid, they're closing down law centres, and in addition to that, in terms of employment rights, now you can't even get out of tribunal unless you put a grand up front. So those, those protections that were introduced by that Attlee government brought and developed by Callaghan, Wilson and the others, and under the last new Labour government. All those protections now have been stripped away from us. This government is now systematically dismantling every element of the welfare state that we, to be frank, my generation, took for granted. Took for granted. And it gets worse, because they don't just want to dismantle, they want to come at us as well. They've introduced the Trade Union Bill in Parliament. 
which I think is an existential threat to trade unionism in this country. I think what they're trying to do now is destroy trade unions once and for all. This government is introducing effectively a scorched earth policy in every policy area. And they see that the trade union movement is one of those areas, one of those organisations with a history of 200 years, the resources and the membership to resist. So therefore they have to take out the one organisation, the one group of people that will mobilise the opposition to them. That's why they've introduced the trade union bill. And some of the measures in the trade union bill are the most draconian we've ever seen. Things that Hatcher never even dreamt of. Against all the international labour organisation conventions and his attack on basic civil liberties. That's what this government is all about. And why? Well, here's the irony, is it? If you, if you introduce measures that reduce wages, because that's what they've done, if you take away trade union rights, we used to have two thirds of our popular our workers covered by collective agreement. We're now less than just about 20%. If you take away those rights and you suppress wages, you stop building houses and house prices, and you stop building council houses in particular, and house prices start increasing, people still have to have a roof over their head. So what do they do? They can't, if the wages doesn't cover it, they borrow. And if you deregulate the banks and allow credit to be loose, what happens is a debt bubble builds up. And then eventually someone says, I can't pay. And others say, I can't pay. And that debt bubble then bursts. And that's the reason for the economic crisis. It's because we suppress wages, we allowed asset prices to rise, we deregulated the banks and the credits, it was like a casino economy, and eventually the debt bubble burst and we had the economic crisis. That's what happened. It was as a result of a succession of policies of undermining the welfare state and undermining workers' rights. Simple as that. This is the irony of it. A short period of time, around about 2007, 2008, people understood what was going on. They saw who it was to blame. It was, all, it was like the Yellow Brick Road. We'd got to the end of the Yellow Brick Road, we'd got to the Emerald City, and then you discovered the Wizard of Oz, and you pulled back the curtain, and all it was was a bloke pulling levers. And that's where we suddenly discovered how the City of London worked. It was complete myth. Even they were out of control. And for a short period of time, I think we all understood how the system was incompetent, how actually it was crisis-ridden, and who was manipulating the system a small elite group of financiers and bankers. And at that point in time, I think people were very angry. But it's interesting, I think one of the biggest propaganda coups that the rich elite, the establishment of this country have had, have been over the last five years, which is just at the time we could see how the system works, how it was crisis-ridden and corrupt. They used the media, they used the arguments and all the rest of it. And all of a sudden, instead of it being a corrupt, incompetent system, it was spending too much on nurses, or police officers, or teachers, or civil servants, and all the rest of it. So we start blaming ourselves. It's extraordinary. We start blaming ourselves. It was the Labour government who spent too much. The levels of expenditure of the last Labour government what never reached a higher percentage of GDP than under John Major and Margaret Thatcher. I should know. I was arguing for them to spend more. All the way through. I was constructing alternative budgets to Gordon Brown, saying you're not spending enough. It wasn't that we borrowed too much to spend on public services. The only time our borrowing went through the roof is when we had to print money on quantitative easing to save the banks from crisis when the credit crunch hit. So here we are in a situation where the Tories, using all the propaganda mechanisms they've got, are actually transforming the argument. So you ask the average person in the street now, why was the crisis caused? Why was that Labour government spending too much? They've forgotten about the bankers who made a fortune at it and walked away scot-free. They've forgotten about the casino economy that they, uh, that they constructed. That's what makes me angry, really. And that's why I have to control, control my language. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why, sitting opposite Osborne and the others, I have to be very careful about the physicality of the relationship. <laughs> because at the end of the day, the people who are paying for the crisis now are still paying for it. The Tories took a conscious decision six years ago that the richest would be protected, the bankers who caused the crisis would not pay for it, but who would? Us. <coughs> Us. They proclaim themselves as One Nation Tories. They do not represent one nation, they represent 1%, the richest in this country. Yeah. The people who What 
what's interesting about all this is somehow, somehow, within the Labour Party in particular, we almost rolled over to that argument. We almost capitulated. And then what happened was is that we were almost vying with them to come forward with policies that met their agenda. That all of a sudden, we were looking for cuts. We were saying it's too much expenditure, too much debt. We were looking for ways in which we could bring together a set of policies that somehow would appease them. And I think that's why we lost the last election. Because people weren't clear about what we were standing for. Ed Miliband was what is, Ed Miliband is one of the nicest folks I've ever met. He's extremely bright and he's extremely committed. I knew his dad as well. Not quite his dad, but there you are. But he's, he's a socialist. But what happened, what happened in the debate within the Labour Party, they became unsure. Are we against austerity or are we austerity light? Are we opposed to cuts in public expenditure or should we be doing some? It was that sort of confusion in our election campaign where candidates were going out on that one hand contending the Tories for cuts and at the same time saying, well, we might have to do some of our own. And all the analysis that one, of the reality of what happened sort of went out the window. And it's interesting, that's, we've just run this leadership campaign. And I'll tell you the story of that, but I think it, it saddens me. I, I was saddened that Ed lost. I wanted him to win, I wanted him to at least be the largest part, and I wanted him to stay on. And I thought, the guy's got it right, but there's a fear of actually telling the truth at some stage. There was an anxiety about confronting them in their own language. That time, can you remember that debate he stood up? And he actually did say, I said, we didn't spend too much. We didn't spend too much. He got howled at. And that demonstrated just how successful the Tories and the media and all the rest had won the argument. Yeah. And how we'd failed to turn it in those five years. What happened about Jeremy's campaign was, as you, as you most probably know, about four months or three months ago, just after the election itself in May, we lost. And people were devastated. I wanted Ed to stay on at least for a period, at least. But he didn't. And I was, Jeremy and I were saying, I was hoping to drift in the next five years to prepare the ground for 2020, a new generation of left coming up. And I was hoping to spend my last few years as the elder statesman on the left, nice quiet life. <laughs> we, we convened a meeting of all the left organisations within the Labour Party called the Left Platform, it's all the little groups together, Welsh Grassroots and all the rest as well, to explain to them there was no way the left could run a candidate. We couldn't get on the ballot paper. Um, Jeremy and I sat down, we thought we'll get we needed 35 nominations. Uh, we got, I calculated 22, Jeremy the eternal optimist tw calculated 23. <laughs> we sat down, we had two meetings of the left platform, packed meetings like, uh, bigger than this, with people talking about whether we should. And there was immense pressure coming from brothers and sisters, comrades within the movement itself, that we should run a candidate if uh, desperately try. And I was worried because I said, don't want to march people up the top of the hill and disillusion them, then they all disperse, thinking we've we failed. And I said we'd lose members from the party. And the, the pressure was so intense that we decided we had a, we'd have a last campaign group <coughs> meeting, which is the left in Parliament, and we went round the table, and there was me, Diane Abbott, and a number of others. So we went round the table, and I said, look, I've done it twice. There's no way they're going to let me on the ballot paper. Had a heart attack a couple of years, only a minor one, but I promised my wife would be careful and all that sort of thing. Diane Abbott did it once, and, and the, the result, you know, as, as you know, she didn't get on. So it came to Jeremy, and basically, well, so we said, came to Jeremy and said, well, we've all had a go. <laughs> we've all had a go. It's your turn. And he said, this, this is the sort of leader I like, the ones you have to force to, to get, get your hand up. And eventually he capitulated. He said, all right, I'll have a go. Right, I'll, I'll have a go. In, we, that was five days before nomination was closed. We put together a group of people. We sat for phone-in MPs and all the rest of it. We had... The thing we had this time, which we never had before, was social media. So we had a group of people working on Twitter and emails and all the rest of it. And we were contacting all the likely MPs we could get nominated, we thought could nominate. And on the Monday, nomination was closed at 12 o'clock lunchtime. Um, by 11 o'clock, having done lots of pressure, uh, arguing people, at least for democratic purposes, put Jeremy on, even if he, they weren't going to vote for him, at least give us a voice, give us a chance, the nomination. We got to 11 o'clock and we were up to about 30. We, we'd done a deal with five of them that if we got to 34, they'd, be, they'd nominate, one of them would nominate onto the 35, we'd get there. We got to 10 seconds to 12, and we were on 33. And we had five of them standing there, 
waiting with papers to see if we'd get to 34. And I did this appeal to them, you know, be well, begging them really, begging them to, to nominate uh, all Dewey eyed and all, all the rest of it. And Wes uh, was the PLP secretary, so the returning officer. So when Big Ben, be when Big Ben sounds, bell goes, and all the rest of it, that's it. And two of them cracked: Andrew Smith and Gordon Marsden. And at 10 seconds to 12, we got on the ballot paper. Now, after that, I'll be frank with you: we thought, I thought, we'd have a good showing. I said we'd shock people, and I thought shocking them would maybe get in 25 or 30 percent of the vote. And that was my objective, because I thought that would demonstrate that there's a left within the party and we might be able to negotiate elements into the shadow cabinet at best of the left, which we haven't had for 20 years. Jeremy Wells started going to his first hustings and we were booking rooms like this, expecting 100, maybe 50. If we got 100 there, we'd be over the moon. The first hustings we'd book rooms like this, 500 people turned up. We got on to... <laughs> Don't clap, it was a period of shock, I tell you. Because <laughs> I was responsible for booking the room, so I got a bit of stick. Uh, then what happened, he toured around the country. In, the, in all, he did 99 meetings all around the country, in terms of England, Wales, Scotland, etc. And his 100th meeting was the nomination meeting, at the final count. We were turning up at meetings. I told him he'd go around on his own. I thought, if we go around together, it looked like last of summer wine on tour, to be honest. <laughs> um, so, literally, he toured around the country, and we were booking halls 500, that's to 1,000. We were having audiences of 1,000, in some instances, 2,000 people. Mm. One of them in Camden, uh, there's a great film of it. The hall holds about, I think, 1,500, something like that, and the whole street outside yes. were people standing. So we had to get a fire engine from the FBU, and he stood on that and spoke. There's films of kids climbing in the windows to get in. And we realised after about a third of the way through, we realised there was something different here. Something, the earth was beginning to move. And basically, when you went to those meetings, there was large numbers of people like us, activists, you know, it's like your life passing in front of you sometimes at these meetings, isn't it, of, of our age. But in addition to that, there's large numbers of young people, huge numbers of young people. Social media had advertised, there was no advertising in the paper. Or well, papers are a traditional advertising. It was social media, word of mouth, etc. And you realised something was changing, there was a different climate. And what it was, I think, is that people were just angry and discontented, didn't believe politicians, were disillusioned with the whole thing. And what happened was, it was the ideal thing. Jeremy just came along, and our strap line, which we chose because it embodies his character and what we're about, was honest politics, straight talking. Someone came along and was honest and told it straight. And people just responded to it. Everything he said was the reflection of the discussions that we've had in meetings like this. You know, the housing crisis that's been caused by failure to build homes, council homes in particular, is easily solvable. It's not rocket science. You build council houses. <coughs> Simple as that. If Harold Wilson, we, I can remember Harold Wilson being criticised for not building half a million a year when he's building 300,000. All you need to do in, in terms of housing, build homes, build council houses. In addition to that, during that period when people are stuck in the private rented sector and the rents are too high, control rents. Introduce fair rent. We used to have fair rents in this country where there was a rent officer who went round and assessed whether it was rent or not based upon levels of income and wages in that area in comparison with other rental levels. It happens right the way across Europe. But Jeremy just simply said there's a simple solution to this. In terms of education, you know, the argument was not all these free schools, academies, and all these other gambles, which is first stages towards privatisation. What we need is to plan our educational system through the local authorities so that we know what the needs are and we plan accordingly. And we don't waste resources on these, uh, these new constructions that the Tories are putting forward, which will lead eventually to privatisation. And to prevent students having the debt when they leave university, the answer is very, very simple. You scrap tuition fees. You just scrap them. There's no point in it. <laughs> Yeah. In terms of the NHS, what we've been arguing for is end all privatisation, end the internal market, which is costing, we think, about 14 billion. Alison Pollock, some of you will be aware of, who was one of the researchers that advised the NHS committee, the health committee at the, at the House of Commons, now in Scotland, was doing the calculations about how much the internal market and how much privatisation was costing us in the NHS. 
If you took that out, we'd be able to afford the money that we need to improve our services. We just went through every area. If you want to improve wages at work, you reintroduce trade union rights. You protect trade unions so that people are properly represented. If you want people legally represented, you make sure they've got access to legal aid. And you start again investing in the law centres. If you want women protected from domestic violence, etc., you stop the closure of the women's refuges that have been going on right away across the country. So Jeremy was just coming forward with straightforward solutions. And people were responding to it. And what was interesting about the young people who turned up, they weren't burdened with the defeatism that came from the 80s and 90s. They actually thought, these are solutions we can campaign for. And as a result, we thought, hang on, there's a movement coming here. There's a movement. This isn't just about the Labour Party. There's a movement coming here of popular resistance to austerity. So the message was straightforward. We're opposed to austerity. Full stop. Then we got to the Saturday a couple of weeks ago when the result came out. I, we, you know, Jeremy and I are his agents, so we go into a private room with the other candidates and all the rest of it, and the result came out. Our canvas returns, we have phone banks, phone banks all around the, the country, etc. And we thought our canvas returns were selling us something between 55 and 60%. And I didn't believe it. I thought, as always, I'm a natural pessimist, I'm a bureaucrat, etc. I thought this was too optimistic. When we got there, 250,000 votes in favour, 60%. Unbelievable result, unbelievable result. And it was a mandate based upon the policies that he'd been advocating all through that campaign. And I don't know whether you saw it on TV, when that result was announced, that whole hall uplifted immediately. And it was a sense of relief and joy and expectation because people felt they were just coming out of the tunnel. You know, a few years ago, so, you know, Someone said to me, is there, is there any light at the end of the tunnel? I said, no, no, just adjust your eyes to the darkness. People actually saw there was light at the end of the tunnel and we were breaking out of it. There was an air of optimism there. All of a sudden, all of a sudden, here was a leader elected on the best basis of straight talking, honest politics and on anti-austerity programme. That was a major breakthrough, I think, not just for Jeremy Corbyn, not just for us in the Labour Party on the left, I think for the whole of the Labour Party, I actually think for the whole of the Labour and Trade Union movement, I also think for the whole of the country, the whole of the country. Now we've just been to, we, we then went into forming a shadow cabinet, and it was tough. We had, we had people resigning from positions on the, that they'd never been offered on the basis of policy they'd never read. <laughs> it was extraordinary. But what we did, we had two principles, going back to the Wilson Callahan Atley year actually, we would build a shadow cabinet on the basis of a reflection of the whole of the politics of the party. If you just had a cabinet on the basis of the left, it wouldn't work. If you had one on the basis of the centre or just the right, it wouldn't work. If you look at Wilson's cabinet in particular, they were left, right and centre brought together. And it was rumbustious, but as a result of that rumbustious debate, you got better decisions. Because discussions that took place, our positions were challenged and compromises were made. And as a result of that, I think better decision making came out of it. So we decided it would be a balanced cabinet. That was the first principle, and that's what Jeremy's put together. No one, no one was not asked to serve. All those people who said at the moment they didn't want to serve, they were offered positions. No one was rejected, no one, we asked people to come in and join us. And actually, if you look at the shadow cabinet now, it does reflect the breadth of opinion within the, the Parliamentary Labour Party. Some have refused to serve, and at the conference this week, we urged them to come back. Just come back and join with us and work with us. Some of them may not come into Shadow Cabinet, but might perform other roles that we were hoping for. Yvette Cooper, give her a due. She said, I can't stand it going to Shadow Cabinet, but I'll continue to work on human rights, refugees, etc. Fantastic. Absolutely. For what commitment. You saw Andy Burnham's speech this week, the other day, serving in Shadow Cabinet and basically saying, look, I lost, but I'm there. I'm still doing my job. I want others to do that as well. And I think that's the sort of comradeliness that we want now. The whole atmosphere of the Parliamentary Labour Party, if you read it in the newspapers, our first Parliamentary Labour Party, you'd think it was frosty. Jeremy went in, it was quiet, a whole series of questions came up, he answered them patiently and with a, well, I think a generosity of spirit, and at the end of that, there was thunderous applause. And people said, well, I might not agree with him on everything, but actually, what we've got now is proper debate. In our first Shadow Cabinet meeting, that same discussion was meant to be confidential, but I'll tell you, it was friendly. And people were saying, look, the old system where the leader dictates everything isn't going to work anymore. We're moving from being that sort of type of party into something different. We're not sure completely yet what that will be, but it's going to be more inclusive, more democratic, and we're moving from being a party into being a social movement again. 
as it was actually under S.O. Davis and before them Keir Hardy, etc. We were a movement, we weren't just a narrow party. And in those days, it wasn't the leader determining who, and the cabinet and the parliamentary Labour Party telling the members what to do, it was the other way around. And we've gone back to that style. At this Labour Party conference, first of all, we've now got 170,000 new members. Between, <laughs> from the day Jeremy got elected to the Labour Party conference, we put on 60,000 members. Actually, it's 70,000 now. During the leadership speech, whilst he was speaking, 500 people joined. <laughs> By the time we'd finished that day, 2,500 more had joined. At the conference this year, I don't know whether you've been to the party conference in recent years, but it's all stage managed, sofas, not much debate, nor the rest. So it's all spin and triangulations. They've reflected what other parties have done. It sort of was under a control regime in that way. And it was, I, was, I was worried it was going to move into the American style, the Democrat and Republican, where they had bands playing and were all wearing hats and marching up and down. And it was getting a bit like that. This year, basically what Jeremy and all of us said, is there will be shorter speeches from the shadow front bench, there'll be more debate, and all this razzmatazz sofas and all out the window, out the window. We want delegates to have their say. And so individual shadow cabinet members were given five minutes, to, they all talk more, but they were five minutes to speak. They edged over it, not so, but more delegates spoke this year than ever before. There was real democratic debate. An additional, in recent years, the number of constituencies sent in delegates has been declining. So a third of de constituencies last year never even sent a delegate. This year, there were 2,500 extra people at the conference. Just de observers and Labour Party members coming in. So instead of us being dominated by corporates and their sponsorship from the stores and all the rest of it, it was rank and file Labour Party members and trade unions coming along. And the atmosphere was friendly, absolutely friendly, comrade in the right thing. Not, we didn't agree on everything. You know, there's all sorts of issues of Syria and Trident and all the rest, but there was comradely debate. And what was interesting is people are getting used to Jeremy's style of politics. He said, we're going to introduce a kinder, more civilised form of political debate in this party. We're going to treat each other with respect. We're not going to be slagging each other off, or difficult to me, I tell you. And we're, not going to get, we're not going to get into this sort of aggression anymore. We're going to actually be, we're going to, we're going to have a kinder form of politics where we respect other people's points of view. And that's what happened at this conference. And that's what happened at every meeting whether it's the Shadow Cabinet or any other layer of the, the membership meetings and all the rest of the, of the Labour Party now. We, I think we've been transformed by that election. Transformed in terms of the numbers of members, transformed in terms of the type of politics we, we, we have, transformed in terms of the development of policies. What happens now? At the end of the conference, what we said was we'd go on the stomp all around the country. So today Jeremy has gone up to Scotland and he said he'd pledged he'll be in Scotland well, at least once a month, and the same with Wales is we've now planned a route around the country where Shadow Cabinet members and Jeremy will go around the country. Not to lecture people, yeah we'll do the big rallies and all that sort of thing, but the most important thing is to get people together. Labour Party members and supporters, many of the people who signed up on the £3 supporter now are actually transferring that into full membership. And that's amazing, I think about 30% have done it already. So we, again we're building a full membership with the supporters as well. But in addition to that we're opening the doors for everyone. There will not be any closed meetings. There will be discussions with party members and supporters for anyone else who wants to come along and tell the general public as well. And the idea is not just to have rallies where people are speaking all the way from the top table. In fact, what um, we're trying to do more and more is, I know it sounds a bit hippieish, but more and more we have our meetings in the round because actually then people are equal status. It's not like being dictated to or anything like that. But the idea is, yes, there'll be speakers, but the most important thing is to allow people to speak. And it isn't just about listening to people, it's actually trying to say, right, well, you start taking the lead on that in your local community. We want people to come together now and through whatever local community organisation they have confidence in, whether it's the Trades Council or whether it's the local parties or whatever, or whether it's a new organisation they need to set up, they build local communities. First of all, communities are in resistance against austerity, but also talking about the future. What do you want the Labour government to do? How do you want your community plan? What sort of housing do you need in the area? What sort of employment? What sort of public services? And start planning for the arrival of a Labour government. Because up until now, I think there's been a lack of confidence we can win in 2020. We will win in 2020. 
we want to go into power with a coherent plan of action, both at, at every level, whether it be the local community, the nation, the region, whatever, wherever you are, we want to actually ensure they've got a coherent plan of action that will work. From the economic point of view, we've made it very, very clear. Austerity is not an economic necessity. It's a political choice. We can sort out the deficit. We can tackle all the issues, the economic issues that are being thrown with us. Very simply, we grow the economy. We make sure the corporations pay their taxes. We stop the tax cuts to the wealthy and make sure we invest in the future. That's the whole of our economic plan, writ large at the national level, and that's reflected at the local level. I think this is one of the most exciting periods of, of, of politics in this country, to be frank. It's almost like going back to that S.O. Davis period and preparing the 1930s before they came to power and the active government after the Second World War. And it's a democratic form of politics. It's not dictated from above. It's going to come from the grassroots. It's a campaigning form of politics. It's no longer a political, just a political party. It's a social movement. We're out there campaigning as well. We're confronting inequality and injustice. Neil Kinnock once asked Bernard Crick, who, who, who I, served, I did my master's under, to go away and define socialism. And he did a little book where he said, actually, in a sentence, what socialism is all about is the achievement of equality through democracy. And that's what we're all about. We're going to create a more equal society through a more democratic society. I think that's incredibly exciting. It's excited this new generation that was supposed to be completely apolitical. It's brought people of all generations back into political activity. This is our moment. Let's make sure we seize the opportunity. I said at the end of my speech in conference, that slogan that we've used for years, another world is possible. Another world is possible, but another world is actually necessary. And it's our job now, like S.O. Davis, to build it. Solidarity. <laughs>